1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. Here before Paul would uh, kind of rebuke the church for don't you have homes to eat in and so forth and so on. And he's given here the directions, the instructions for what we call communion, the Lord's Supper. That same night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas, that he went to be crucified, Jesus would share this with his disciples there in the upper room. He would take the cup, he would take the bread, and he would, he would give it as an example of what he was doing for you and I. His body was being broken. His blood was being shed for our sin, to pay the price that we owed because of our sin. Not owed to the devil. Well, the devil's not owed anything. But this was owed to God. And Jesus stepped in and paid that price for us through His body and His blood. And Paul would say in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Mm, that broken body. He said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And here's the key. This do in remembrance of me. What Jesus was saying was each time we take this bread, each time we drink this cup, we remember the price that He paid. We place our faith in that price, in that sacrifice, and that sacrifice alone. And we got to have this thing remembering, coming, we got to be remembering this constantly. Because in this flesh, in this daily life, we tend to forget what the Lord has done. And we start thinking, we start trusting in our own doing, really. This brings us back to the cold, hard truth, if you want to put it that way, to the reality. It's, I guess, maybe a better way to say it. That there's nothing that you can do. It's all about what Jesus did on that cross. Father, we thank you, Lord, for that body that was broken for us. We thank you, Lord, that you paid that price 2,000 years ago. And, Lord, we, we take remembrance this morning of that that you have done for us. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Let's take the bread. Verse 25, he says, After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, you know what that means there? He took part. The husbandman must first be partaker of the fruit. He experienced it first for you and I. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death Till he come. Jesus died on Calvary. He rose again the third day. But what did he say? I'm coming back. I've gone to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And he said, I'm coming back. I want to tell you, he's coming back. We're closer today than we've ever been before. And that's not just a cliche or something. There are things going on in this world today. There are things going on in Europe, in the Middle East, here in America. There are things going on in this world today. We don't, it don't take a genius to see it. All it takes is somebody who understands the Word of God that sees this coming. These things have been coming to pass for a long time now, and it's all coming together. You know, we want to say this, it's falling apart. It's all coming together. God's plan's coming together. We're on the very eve of the rapture of the church. It could happen before we leave here today, folks. 
Keep your heart right with God. Keep looking to Him. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till He come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning or understanding the Lord's body. We eat and drink unworthily when we just do it as a ritual. We eat and drink it unworthily whenever our faith is not in who Jesus is and what He did for us at Calvary. Oh, it's just an ordinance of the church. It's just something we do once a month. That's trodden underfoot the blood of Christ as it talks about in Hebrews. Don't be guilty of that. Examine yourself. Is my faith in who He is and what He's done for me at Calvary? Or am I trusting other things? There's 101 billion other things you can be trusting. But there's only one thing you can trust that will carry you through. And that's what He did for us at Calvary. Amen? Father, we thank You for that blood that was shed at Calvary. Lord, we thank You, Father, that You paid that price for our sin. You paid it in Your own blood. Lord, I'm asking that each person, Lord, present this morning, whether in this place or by YouTube or, or Facebook, Father, that, Lord, that they would examine themselves. Lord, that they would put their trust wholly and completely in that blood of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, Father. Lord, we thank you for that blood shed for us in Jesus' name. Let's take the cup. Spend a few minutes this morning just thanking Him, giving Him glory for what He's done for you, singing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive glory and power and honor and dominion. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy. Let's sing that this morning real quick. Worthy, oh, worthy are you, Lord. Worthy to be thanked and praised and worshipped and adored. Worthy, oh, worthy are you, Lord. Worthy to be thanked and praised and worshipped and adored singing hallelujah the Lord more than a conqueror he is Lord of everything is he Lord of your life this morning mm, make him Lord of your life today give your heart to him amen amen kids can be dismissed this morning we're over in if you will turn with me to Philemon Philemon however somebody wants to say that one little chapter, 25 verses, but a very powerful book, very powerful letter that we need, all need to understand, we need to study it. And you know, we've been going through these letters of Paul that Paul has written to the churches. We're fixing to get into a, a very large letter, probably the largest letter Maybe, I think it might be bigger than Romans. 
But that book of Hebrew, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, and we're going to go into Hebrews starting next week. And be prepared. We're going to be there for a little while because there's a lot there. You know, some scholars would say that, oh, well, it doesn't apply to us today. As I was doing a little study this week, that's what one brought out that, you know, oh, these situations aren't, uh, aren't for us today, but I want to tell you they are. Just as they were for the church then, though it may have been written to Jewish believers, it was written to believers. And in Christ there's neither bond nor free, male or female, Jew or Gentile, but we're all one in Christ. That's what we're going to see here in Philemon this morning. We're all one in Christ. And as we understand this Philemon or Philemon, however you want to look at it or call his name, he was not necessarily the pastor. Some say that his son Archippus was the pastor there of the church in Colossae, but that that church was uh, held, or at least one of the churches in Colossae, if there may have been more possibly, one of the, the groups met in Philemon's house. Philemon was a man who had some wealth. Philemon was somebody that they say that came to Christ through the ministry of Paul at Ephesus. But Philemon was a devout follower of Jesus Christ. But you know what? Philemon, he wasn't perfect. Do you realize that in this letter, Paul is dealing with slavery? Slavery is and has been, it still is, if you don't know that, just because you don't see it here in America much, not yet anyway. But uh, it still is, I think in 70-some nations of the world, they still practice slavery in those nations of one kind or another. But it has been done away with in Christ. And as we understand this letter and we understand what Paul has written here, this is one of the premier uh, causes for the abolition or abolishing of slavery, you know, as it was in the world of Paul's day, it was a very common widespread thing. And it wasn't just white people having black people. It was anybody having anybody. That's what slavery is. And we were all, if we understand it correctly, if we, were, we were all born a slave to sin. We were all born in bondage to sin. And just as Jesus Christ has set us free from the power of sin, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the premier factor, the premier cause for slavery having been abolished in the United States and in Europe of the day. It, was, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ is what abolished that slavery in those times are what led to the, the abolishment of slavery and even in the times of Paul in some cases. But do you know today as the gospel is waning, if I guess you could say as, as, as this nation, let's just use America for an example, as this nation gets further and further away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, do you know that slavery is on the uprise in America today? Do you know that a lot of the folks that the political party in power, let's just put it that way, is allowing to come across the border today. They're allowing it because they want some servant class. They want a slavery class. And I want to tell you this morning, if you are voting in that direction, you're voting for something that is totally against the Word of God because Jesus Christ came to set the captive free. Unfortunately, a lot of people will sell themselves. You know, there, there used to be what was called indentured servants. They were to serve for a period of time and then they were to be set free. And in that, some weren't set free. They were held continually, unjustly. But the Word of God is the only thing that sets the captive free, be it spiritually or physically. If you find yourself bound this morning by sin, by drugs, by alcohol, whatever it is, you can be, you are free. We sung it this morning. That blood that gives the victory, as we give glory to Him, He gives us that victory that was found in the blood. 
You're free already. You are free indeed. Do you know it this morning? Are you walking in that liberty and in that freedom? As well as what I've titled this message, really though, and what is what applies today, and like I said a little bit earlier, this letter is going to meddle in our lives. Some more than others, but it's going to meddle in all of our lives. But I entitled this Brother to Brother. Let me see what else I wrote. I can't read it. Relationships. Brother to Brother Relationships. Because that's what we see as Paul is addressing this letter to, to Philemon. He's not addressing it to him as the Apostle Paul. Like the man in authority. He could have, but he didn't. Because Jesus Christ did not come here having a, or, or demonstrating and having authority over man, so to speak. You see, the authority that you and I have, we need to understand our authority, our dominion is not over one another. Like I said a little bit earlier, there is neither bond nor free, male nor female, Jew or Gentile in Christ Jesus, when we come to Jesus, when we come and, and we give our hearts and our lives to Christ, we're at the foot of the cross, we've heard the term before, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There is no hierarchy in the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is the head, we are the body, and each part of the body has its own peculiar function, but we are all given to, we are all to be in subjection to the head who is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. No apostle, no deacon, no uh, district overseer, and whoever, whatever they might call themselves is to have authority over any other. And that's what we see demonstrated by Paul in this letter to Philemon. Paul begins this letter, he says, Paul, in a, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy our brother to Philemon our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. We can see just in the introduction here of this letter that Paul gives that he's, he's not coming to Philemon. He's not coming to him on behalf of Onesimus. He doesn't even mention Onesimus, the escaped slave, the runaway slave until later on in the letter. But he comes to Philemon and he says, you are, we are brothers, we are fellow laborers, you with me and me with you and us with Timothy and all the others here. We are all on equal footing and equal ground. We need to understand that in the church today. We got a lot of folks in the church today that they would think, oh, because... I've been in the church or I've been preaching so long and such and such or I'm of this and that that you need to be listening to me. That's not biblical. You see, God can speak to that three-year-old just like He can speak to you and I. That ten-year-old. He can speak to Granny just like He can speak to that young man that's just gotten out of Bible college. Thinks he's all this and that because he's got a two-year, four-year, six-year, whatever degree in this study, that study, the other study. The, I know Greg mentioned something to y'all that Sunday we were gone. This lady comes up to me and she says, first, things out of, first words out of her mouth, she read what was on my shirt. It said, normal isn't coming back, but Jesus is. Amen. She comes up to me and she says, I've been studying Hebrew for ten years now. Watch out, folks. Somebody been full of themselves when the very first words out of their mouth is, look at me. You need to listen to me because of who I am. Mm -mm. Then she proceeded to tell me just how wrong I was for having Jesus on my shirt. Bunch of hogwash. See, we got to know the Word of God. Amen. This woman wasn't even a Jew, but she tried to curse me in Hebrew. It was just about as meaningful as the words that came out of her mouth. It didn't mean diddly do. I have nothing to fear about somebody doing that. Because my trust is in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I have His Word. He is watching my back. He's taking care of me. Amen? But Paul is telling, is starting out here, and he's not starting out in a spirit of haughtiness or an attitude of, I'm superior to you. 
See, you know, we got a lot of superior attitudes on Facebook today. One brother will post something and the other brother will say something about it like, I know more than you and you ought to be listening to me. And blah. I'm going to tell you right now, he can claim they can claim all day long their faith is in Christ and Him crucified, but if it isn't showing in their attitude, if this isn't the attitude that we have, you see, Paul... To Paul was given the meaning of the new covenant. He, to Paul was given, if you will, the message of the cross. And he revealed it to us. Paul, of all people, could have been the one standing up and saying, I got the revelation and you need to listen to me here, Philemon. Slavery ain't no good and you better not be doing this. See, he could have come to him in that manner and Philemon would have bowed up because that's in all of us. Mm, we wonder why people bow up whenever we try to say something to them. What kind of spirit are we saying it in? Are we saying it in a spirit of love? Or are we saying, hey man, this is what God has revealed to me. You know, sometimes they're not in the same place that you are in their walk. Even those who act high and mighty... You see, we need to understand that as we understand the cross that you know we don't need to ta attack out at them. We don't need to reply back to them. We need to be silent. Just let the Lord fight the battle. Let Him teach them. Pretty soon He's going to bring them along. Pretty soon He's going to teach them. Just like He did you and I. We didn't come out of... I'm just going to say this. There are those out there that they're getting the message of the cross, but they haven't come out of the error that they've been in and if we go lambasting them and in a higher haughtier high mighty attitude they never will because if they see in us that we claim the message of the cross and we they we don't display the fruit of the cross in our lives they're going to say i don't want none of that amen, amen. well there's a lot of lesson here like we look there in Titus and in Timothy when Paul was telling the, them what to look for and those that he would appoint as an elder of the church, we brought it out then, that, that, that lifestyle, that, those characteristics were to be in their lives before. Mm. That means they were just a regular, ordinary, everyday believer just like you and I. And if their faith is in, if our faith is in who Jesus is and what He did for us at Calvary, the characteristic that Paul lines out for Titus and Timothy should be evident in our life. We see here in this letter that he's writing to Philemon those characteristics in Paul's life. Mm. And Paul knew those characteristics were in Philemon's life, else he would have directed this letter in a different direction to get across to him that same the same point that he was trying to with his escaped, his runaway slave Onesimus. But see, we need to be letting the Holy Spirit do that work in us. We need to be letting the Holy Spirit be doing that work in others. Mm. What's Brother Larson say? Eat off your own plate? It's a smorgasbord? We all got our issues. Let the Holy Spirit deal with them you know, it might be that He could use you in some way to instruct or exhort or maybe even rebuke sometimes. But that rebuking even has to be done in a spirit of love. What is the first fruit of the Spirit? It's love. That love is that agape love. That unconditional, unselfish. That love that doesn't seek its own, but it seeks the benefit of the one love. You see, that's what agape love is. That's the love. That's the love that God has for you and I in that He sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us. And it's that kind of love that He's trying to produce, reproduce in our hearts and lives. See, that's what we were meant. That's what God made man for. When He breathed the breath of life into Adam, it was that that love, that God kind of love be in Adam towards his wife and towards the creation, towards everything. That we were willing to give of ourselves as God was willing to give of Himself for the ones that He loved. Boy, how many marriages and family relationships could be healed and be 
brought back right. If somebody in that family got a hold of the message of the cross and the Holy Spirit went to work in their lives and started producing that kind of love, Amen. what a difference it would make in our churches. What a difference it would make in our nation. Yes. Hmm. One day it will be there. But only when Christ rules and reigns. But you know what? It, you don't have to wait for that. It can be in your heart and life today. If you'll let the Holy Spirit do that work. So Paul says that he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. If you have an expositor, it probably brings out the fact that Paul is not claiming himself to be a prisoner of Nero or any state or government system. But he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. At this time that Paul was writing this letter to Philemon, they say it was his first time of being in prison in Rome. He was in prison for preaching the gospel. Get ready. If you're going to preach the gospel, you're going to have some hard times. It's not a bed of roses. Just because you're preaching the gospel don't mean you're going to tiptoe through the tulips and everything's going to be hunky-dory and everybody's going to love you and like you. Majority of people are not going to like you. Majority of the people, they don't like the church today, the church that preaches the gospel because it comes against. The gospel says you can be free from your sin. You don't have to be bound by your sin. You don't have to live a lifestyle of sin and spend eternity separated from God. See, the world wants to live their lifestyle of sin and still think that they can go be in heaven for eternity. It's not going to happen. Not unless your, your sins must be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. they got to be under the blood. Is God seeing your sin or is He seeing the blood of the Lamb applied to your heart and life? You see, it's only applied by faith. But Paul declares himself to be a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He is where he is at. He is in prison for preaching the gospel because that's where Jesus, that's where God wants him to be at that time. Can you imagine that today? A believer today in prison for preaching the gospel and he's not over there wallowing in the muck saying, Poor is me, woe little me, oh my, oh my, gloom, despair, and agony on me. I'm in jail for preaching the gospel. What are you doing, God? Paul said, Lord, you know what you're doing and I trust you. If Paul could do that in prison, well, we, some of us, we get a hangnail and it's, Oh, God, lift me! We go berserk, don't we? God hasn't left you. Maybe he's just wanting to see just what it takes. If it takes a hangnail for you to lose faith, buddy, you ain't got much faith. Mm, your faith ain't even that of a grain of mustard seed because he said mustard seed faith would move a mountain. <laughs> your faith ain't even enough for you to stop your whining when you get a hangnail. My, 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 how, how fickle we can be. But he said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He says, Timothy, our brother. So Timothy was with him. And he's writing to Philemon. He calls him dearly beloved. Most greatly loved. It says in our fellow laborer. See Paul knew what was going on in the lives of those in the churches of that day. He says and to our beloved Appia. Appia. That's his wife. Brother Ray mentioned something this morning. He got saved under a woman preacher. Every indication here is that Philemon's wife was very active in the church that was in their home. And she wasn't just cleaning the toilet and vacuuming the floor. She was ministering. She was working. She was doing what needed to be done in the work of the ministry. And she got a... Understand this. If Paul and the Holy Spirit can give mention and give acknowledgement to a woman taking part in the gospel today, who are we, or the gospel of that day, who are we to say, oh, women can't be preachers? Hmm. There we go with some arrogance and some hierarchy. God's going to use whoever's going to yield to Him. Be it man, woman, boy, or girl. My goodness, He'll even use a donkey. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. 
Mm. If he can use a donkey, he can use anything. He used them birds to feed his prophet. Anyone that will yield, don't be stubborn. Yield to the Lord. Mm. To our beloved Aphia and Archippus, which they say was uh, Philemon's son there, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. They say that Archippus may have even been the pastor. Philemon was just the one who provided the place for him to meet. But you see, we got a family, a family taking care, doing the gospel, ministering to the people around them here. He says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say just this. There is no grace. There is no peace that we're going to have outside of Christ and what He did for us at Calvary and our faith resting there. Mm. Mm. You see, that same grace that He has given us needs to be flowing through us to others. That same peace that He has given us needs to be extended towards others because that grace and peace only comes as our faith is resting in who He is and what He did. How do you know if somebody's really not trusting in Christ? They're not walking in grace. Extending that grace to others. There's no peace. Hmm. Time for examination again. Is that peace in my life? Is that grace? Not just the grace that God gives to us. That's, that's awesome. But see, God wants to produce that same grace in our hearts and in our lives. And it only takes place by the power of the Spirit working in us. And the Spirit only works in us as our faith is resting in who Jesus is and what He did. That's the law of the Spirit. That's how God has designed for the Holy Spirit to work. He will not, God, the Holy Spirit's not a lawbreaker. He's not a law bender. He's not a, well, we'll go outside the box, if you will. We'll go outside the box on just this one occasion for Joe over here. Mm -mm. He remains within the parameters that God has set. And he will not deviate from them. Therefore, if we are going to be recipients of his grace and his peace, we've got to be in the parameters that God has set for us. That parameter is faith in Christ and him crucified. If we don't have peace, if we don't have that grace, somewhere we're not trusting the Lord. Because when we're trusting the Lord, I've said it before, whenever I'm trusting the Lord, I don't have to lie. You understand that? The, the, the Ten Commandments out there that we've got on the yard, I don't have to lie. I don't have to steal. I don't have to commit adultery. If I have but one God, if my God is the God Jehovah and my faith and my trust is in Him, I don't have to lie to you about anything or anybody else. I don't have to steal what you got. I don't have to covet what you got because I'm trusting in my God my Savior, my Lord, to provide for me everything that my Master, to provide for me everything that I have need of, and I'm looking to Him and Him alone for every need in my life. You see, it's whenever we start looking elsewhere, when we start turning to somebody or something else, that we start telling a little white lie, or that we start wanting to pick the candy bar up off the 7-Eleven shelf, or whatever it might be, coveting our brother's whatever that we get in trouble when our faith is in, on something other when we start trusting in ourselves we deviate we get outside God's parameters you see our faith must rest in Him He says grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ Verse 4. Let me put my glasses on so I can read my note. Paul here acknowledges the work of the Spirit in the heart and life of Philemon, brought about because of his faith in Christ and the cross. What Paul is going to go through here in verses 4 through 7 should be evident in every one of our hearts and lives as we're trusting in Christ. And they will be evident. Hmm. We think, oh, I've got to work and work this thing up. We have to strive to have these qualities in our lives. You see, if we're striving for these qualities, and maybe, maybe we are a nice guy. 
But we start to say, oh, because I. You see, as, as we have our faith in who Jesus is and what He did for us at Calvary, the Holy Spirit is going to bring about these things in our life. And we, are, will, be, we will be of the mind and the heart that we say, I couldn't have done that on my own. I couldn't have been that nice guy, that humility. I couldn't have extended that grace and that mercy to that person who slapped me up across the head or cut my tires or whatever it is they did. I couldn't have turned to them the other cheek or walked the extra mile except the Holy Spirit do that work in me. Mm. You see... When we conjure it up on our own, we only end up with self-righteousness. But as we put our trust in Christ and it's the Holy Spirit doing that work, it works humility. And I think I've said it before, you know, the more that we learn about what Christ has done for us on the cross, the more humble we're going to be because we realize it ain't of me. I'm a jerk. I'm a loud mouth. I'm a hard nose. I want to knock you upside the head if you just look at me cross-eyed. You see, it takes the Holy Spirit to say, Not my will, but thy will be done. Paul begins here in verse 4. He says, I thank my God. Hmm. Thankfulness to God. Making mention of you always in my prayers. First and foremost... You know, as I was studying this, we're quick. When we go to somebody that we think, oh, they're in the wrong or they're not understanding. Let's just use believers. They're not understanding Scripture like I understand Scripture. They put something on their Facebook and boy, it just didn't sound right. So I said they were a jerk or they were stupid or something like I just lashed out at them. What's Paul saying here? He said, I thank God making mention of you always in my prayers. You see, Paul is, he knows what he's going to say to Philemon. He knows what's taking place with Onesimus, the runaway slave. But Paul is telling Philemon, before I ever even sat down to write this letter, I was thanking God for you. Mm. When's the last time you thank God for that brother that you think is in the wrong? When is the last time you prayed for that brother that you think is in the wrong before you opened up your big mouth? You see, we're quick to bust somebody down with our mouth, but are we as quick to pray for them? Before? Mmm. Mmm. Be praying for them before you blast them. Because I think after you've been praying for him, you won't be wanting to blast them. You'll be saying, Lord, open their eyes. And you know, it may just be that you don't understand what they said. They may have been coming from a totally different thing. You know, half the time, we listen to somebody preach or somebody teaching or something like that, and we're just, we don't, we zone out. I'll guarantee you, y'all won't be able to say, remember everything I said this morning. I probably won't even remember everything I said this morning. But you know what? We need to slow down. We need to be praying before we're opening. We need to be praying with our mouth before we're opening our mouth to our brothers and sisters. Amen? I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. Mm. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou first hast toward the Lord Jesus First and foremost, you see, Paul is saying this must come first. If this is first, then what follows will be next. And I got some red stars on some of these notes, so we need to look at those. He says, Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. If love and faith are anchored in Christ, it will, it will as well extend towards all saints. Saints, all brothers, brother to brother, brother to sister. You see, you can't, what Jesus say? 
If you say that you have love for me, but you hate your brother, you ain't got no love. If you're saying your faith is in Christ, sure, that's the same thing as saying I love Jesus with all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my... But if you're out there blowing up at your brother and sister because of some little thing they may have said or done, even if it's in the wrong, slavery, it was a thing of that day, but in the, but, but in the Word of God, and because of what Christ has done, Paul is bringing it to the forefront here saying... It ought not to be. Hmm. Because we've been set free in Christ, spiritually speaking. We can be set free physically as well. Hmm. No man should own another man. We're not property. We're owned. He is our master. We, man cannot serve two masters, but one master, our Heavenly Father. Hmm. So if we say we have love for God and we don't have love or our faith is in Christ and there's not that love because love is the first of the fruits of the Spirit that's produced as we have faith in Christ and Him crucified. Love for our family? Let's just get a little bit deeper here. It's going to show up at home first. I think we mentioned that here a while back going to show up in that relationship between husband and wife and dads and kids and moms and kids and wife to husband. Mm. Husbands, love your wives. How? As Christ loved the church. He died and gave himself for her, for us. Are you willing? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I'm willing to die and give myself. Are you? Are you willing to live and give yourself? Mm. That's a tough one there. Oh, I'll die for you. A lot of us say, I'll die for Jesus. Are we willing to live for Him? I say we're not willing to die until we're willing to live. Because really, that dying means I, me, self, has to die. Okay. Sir, are you willing to give up yourself? Everything about you? For her? For them? Mm. Told you there's going to be some meddling. That's what Paul's doing. That's what the Spirit's doing in this letter. He's meddling in our business. And if we'll let him, we'll come out on the other side more of the image of Christ. But you know what? It won't be to give glory to you once again. It'll be to give glory to Him. We'll see what He's done for us at Calvary. With proper faith in Christ and Him crucified, the fruit of the, the, fruit of the Spirit would definitely be developed in the heart and life of Philemon. And such would fall out to good works carried forth to others, all generated by proper faith. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and mm, they go hand in hand toward all the saints that the communication this is the prayer that Paul is praying mm, oh my goodness preacher to preacher believer to believer we've gone through a number of Paul's letters we understand we are all ministers of Christ in one way or another. I don't care if you're a mom that keeps home or you're a dad that works two or three jobs. We are all ministers in one way or another. He says that the communication of thy faith, this is what Paul is praying for Philemon. Is this what we're praying for one another? That this communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. You see, as our faith is resting in Christ, who He is and what He's done, there will be those good things, those good works, those actions that come forth, that love, that joy, that peace of God in our hearts and our lives. And it will be shed abroad, as He says in other places, to those around us that the communication 
That's not just the talking with your mouth, but that's the lifestyle that you live. That it'll be evident. Oh, what did Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart. We're hitting it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Like I said, are you praying for that brother before you nail him to the cross? Because if you're praying for him, you won't be putting the nails up there and the hammer. Mm. You will be living a life that demonstrates the message of the cross. A message of mercy and grace to one another. Give him some room to grow. You're not going to, you know, there ain't no, you ain't going to plant a tomato plant and go out there and smack it down with something. It ain't going to produce any tomatoes, is it? Don't be smacking down your brother as he's trying to grow in the Lord. We need to be encouraging you. That's what Paul's doing here. <coughs> Before he addresses the situation at hand, he's encouraging. He sees these things are evident. And because these things are evident in Philemon's life, Paul knows that when he gets down to business here in verse 8, Paul knows that these things being in the life of Philemon, he's going to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. But Paul is acknowledging that, hey, brother, I see this in you. This that's produced because your faith is in who Jesus is and what he did. And he's, then he's going to address the situation at hand. And he's still, he's not commanding Philemon in any way, shape, or form because Paul is not standing in that position. He's not sta he could have, but he's not. And that's a lesson for us. We're not to stand in a position of, I got the authority and therefore you must hear me. And do as I say. But he's saying, brother, I know because these things are evident in your life, you're going to be led by the Holy Spirit as I communicate this to you and what needs to take place. He says, hearing of thy love and faith. We already read that. Verse 6, that the communication of thy faith. How are we communicating our faith? Mm. Mm. How are we communicating it to the world around us? Christian on Facebook getting into arguments with other believers on Facebook or wherever, YouTube, I don't know. How are we communicating our faith? Is there one that makes the world say, I want some of that? Or makes the world say, I don't want none of that. I got that already. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual. Hmm. Hmm. You know what that tells us too? That our our by the deeds and actions, the words that come out of our mouth sometimes, it can be ineffectual. You can say it all day long, but if you ain't acting it, if you ain't living it out, you're a hypocrite. Plain and simple. That your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. It ain't in you except by through Christ. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love. Because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Mm. Mm. Are we a refreshing or are we a burden? That word refresh there is the same one that Jesus would use when he said, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The saints are rested you want to use that word, by you. Hmm. Do we bring rest, a refreshing? Are the words that we speak, is the life that we live, what we present to the world around us, is it a life of refreshing? Is it one that says, I want to go there and drink, have a drink of cold water? Or is our life always one of, oh, I'm blah, 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 blah. Always bad-mouthing, downcast. Always seeing the bad. Criticizing. Mm. Mm. We got a lot of armchair quarterbacks. We got armchair quarterbacks that are pretending to have faith in Christ and Him crucified. Criticizing everybody that's out there preaching. And they ain't even a preacher more or less 
they don't have a pulpit in a church, but they're preaching something. I'm going to tell you, that's not somebody whose faith is in Christ and Him crucified. Somebody who's always criticizing. Now, who are you to judge another man's servant? Before his own master, he stands or he falls. We spend so much time, we waste, let me put it that way. We waste so much time criticizing others when we need to be looking at the beam that's in our eye. Like I said, we're all messed up. We got enough in all of us. We don't need a we can we can I don't want to say criticize, but we can evaluate the doctrine, but leave the man to God or the woman. Leave them to the Lord. Now there are some what does Paul say there in Titus after one or two times turn away from them don't be even messing with them leave them to the Lord I don't mean we don't pray for them too like I said I mean we could leave Joe Biden to the Lord or we can on Joe Biden we need to be praying for that man he is a soul is a soul that is lost regardless what we think about his politics and how messed up they are just let you know what I think about them He's a soul and we need to be praying for him. Just like somebody would need to be praying for you. Somebody did pray for you. When you was all messed up. Anybody here not been messed up? We all been messed up. Thank the Lord that maybe somebody did pray for us. Thank the Lord that he did get a hold of us. And we're where we are today. We have great joy and consolation in thy love. Because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee. Those bowels, that's an old English word for the hearts. The inmost being are refreshed by thee. We're going to try to move through this. Wherefore, for this reason, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech you. Mm, Paul could have commanded, but Paul says... I'm asking of you, brother. I'm coming to you as a beggar might, and I'm asking you. Boy, how much confrontation could we avoid in our homes, in our relationships with others, if we came with an attitude of, hey, let me help you out here, rather than one of condemnation or one of judgment or one of just flat out arrogance sometimes and we're all guilty of it we've been there in our zealousness for the message of the cross we've been arrogant towards others and how we've dealt with them in that message and who knows the harm that we've caused to push them away from the very message that we're trying to get them to understand hmm. but see it's a work of the spirit in all of us we can just step back and say, Lord, forgive me for messing up. Lord, teach me and help me not to mess up again. Lord, to have that same mind that was in Christ, that though He was God, He didn't present Himself as the authority, but He came as a servant, and He gave Himself for us. Amen? Mm. Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Once again, he says, I am a prisoner of the Lord. Not of Nero. I'm a servant of God. He says, I beseech thee. Once again, I beseech, I beg of you. I'm asking you, I'm not commanding. For my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now, he brings up Onesimus here. Onesimus was that runaway slave. Oh, Philemon had no idea where Onesimus was. But even in this, even that Onesimus had run away from Philemon, where did he run to? But he ran to Rome and in some way or another, God brought him into that place where he, he met Paul and he heard the gospel and gave his heart and his life to Jesus Christ 
and it changed Onesimus. I want to tell you this morning, when we come to Jesus Christ, there's a change in our hearts and in our lives. You won't be the same. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. No more bound by sin, bound by drugs, homosexuality, whatever it was. But when we come to Jesus, we are set free and free indeed. There's a change. Onesimus, when he ran away, he was a belligerent, lazy bomb of a slave. He stole, they say, from Philemon. But yet God intervened. And all the way from Colossae to Rome, God intervened. And He had a plan. And God used that plan then to speak to you and I today. Do you understand that? Man, oh man, God, down 2,000 years ago. Onesimus runs away thinking I'm free but he was still bound by sin he didn't realize it maybe he stole something in Rome and got thrown in prison with Paul some way or another he came in contact with Paul and Paul preached the gospel mm, and he got saved and it changed him and Paul saw that change I want to tell you if you're hearing a gospel message, you can be hearing the right gospel message. I've got to say this carefully because you can be hearing the right gospel message and not receiving it in your heart and there'll be no change. But if you say you've given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ and you're trusting in Him and what He did at Calvary, my friend, there better be a change. Because you're a new creation. What does it say there? in You're a new creation Old things are passed away. That means the man you were before, the woman you were before, you're not any longer. Those old things, that hot head you had, it's gone in Jesus' name. Those drugs that you were doing, they're gone in Jesus' name. You don't need them any longer. The high you get from Jesus is greater than anything you're going to get from any pot or drug or whatever. Hmm. Meddling, ain't we? That's what the Holy Spirit does. He meddles in our hearts and in our lives. For love's sake, I beseech you. Got to start on that one. We'll, be a, we'll, 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 we'll get to lunch. We ain't got to wait at the restaurant for nothing. Oh, my goodness. That's a big old long one. That's one I wanted to read, too. Hmm. This is, as I was studying... This is from a guy named Alexander McLaren. I don't know who he is, but what he said is good. For love's sake. Let's read this. Here is seen love which beseeches where it might command. The first word wherefore of verse 8 leads back to the preceding sentence and makes Philemon's past, makes Philemon's past kindness to the saints the reason for his being asked to be kind now. There are people like the horse and the mule who understand only rough imperatives backed by force. But they are fewer than we are apt to think. Boy, how often we deal with everybody that way. And perhaps gentleness is never wholly thrown away. The Holy Spirit is here showing us that while many directions may be taken regarding situations such as this, the great motive for love's sake is the way of the Lord. That grand sacred principle, says Paul, bids me put away authority and speak in entreaty. Love naturally beseeches. Hmm, we see that in the Lord and how He deals with us. He doesn't command. His love draws us to repentance. For love's sake is the way of the Lord. That grand, sacred principle, says Paul, bids me put away authority and speak in entreaty. Love naturally beseeches and does not order. In fact, the harsh voice of command is simply 
the imposition of another's will and it belongs to relationships in which the heart has no share. You hear that? We need to read that again. The sacred principle, Paul says, okay, love naturally beseeches and does not order. In fact, the harsh voice of command is simply the imposition of another's will. When we're commanding something, we're trying to force our will. When we come to somebody in a commanding, forceful way, we're trying to put our will upon them is what the writer is saying here. But wherever love is the bound, grace is poured into the lips. And I enjoin becomes I pray. So that even where the outward form of authority is still kept, as in a parent to young children, there will ever be some endearing word to swath the harsh imperative in tenderness. Like a sword blade wrapped about with wool, lest it should wound, Love tends to obliterate the hard distinction of superior and inferior. It seeks not for mere compliance with commands, but for oneness of will. Hmm. This means that the lightest wish breathed by loved lips is stronger than all stern injunctions, even stronger than all laws of duty. In fact, the heart is so turned as to vibrate only to that one tone. As an example, the demoniac who, <clears throat> whom no chain could bind is found sitting at the feet of incarnate gentleness. So the wish of love is all-powerful with loving hearts and its faintest whisper louder and more constraining than the trumpets of Sinai. There is a large lesson here for all human relationships. Fathers, mothers, husbands and wives, friends and companions, teachers, preachers and guides of all sorts should set their conduct by this pattern and let the law of love sit ever upon their lips. Actually, authority is the weapon of a weak man who is doubtful of his own power to get himself obeyed or of a selfish one who seeks for mechanical submission rather than for the obedience of willing hearts. Love is the weapon of a strong man who can cast aside the trappings of superiority and is never loftier than when he descends, nor more uh, absolute than when he lays aside authority and appeals with love to love. While civil government must function in the realm of authority and for all the obvious reasons, such must never be the way of followers of the Lord. As Paul said, we owe civil authorities our obedience, but we owe fellow Christians love only. Romans 13, 1 through 8. There's a glimpse here. I'm sorry this is long, but y'all should read. There's a glimpse here into the heart of Christ's rule over men. He too does not merely impose commands, but stoops to entreat where he indeed might command. Henceforth I call you not servants, but friends. And though he does go on to say, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you, yet his commandment has in it so much tenderness, condescension, and pleading love that it sounds far more like beseeching than commanding. His yoke is easy. For this among other reasons, that is, if one may say so, padded with love. His burden is light because it is laid upon his, his servant's shoulders by a loving hand. And so, as Bernard says, it is a burden which carries with him, which, which carries him who carries it. Love. Now see, in the church today, we've taken love to be all accepting of all sin and everything else. But we need to understand that love confronts sin. God in His love for us confronted sin and sent Jesus Christ to die for our sin. That we don't have to be bound any longer by it. That harshness, that anger, whatever it might be, 
You don't have to be bound by that any longer. You can be set free in Jesus' name. He says, Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech you for my son Onesimus. Paul calls him his son because Onesimus the slave was saved through the ministry of Paul. He says, Whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in past times, understand this, in past times was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Is there a one of us in here? What Paul is saying here, in past times he was unprofitable. Before he was saved, he was of no profit. He was of no profit to you, Philemon. He was of no profit to the kingdom of God. He was utterly useless. That's a picture. Onesimus, bound by sin. Anybody in here never been bound by sin? You are now because you're lying if you raise your hand. But see, just as you and I, we were bound by sin. We were useless. Every person bound by sin is unprofitable. Nothing they do. You see, God looks at profit different than we do. We look at profit. Oh, I made so much money today. That profited me. Or the, this came out in my favor. That profited me. God ain't looking at this physical world. He's looking spiritually. Are we profitable spiritually? Are we growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord? That's a profit. That's profitable for us. It's good for you and I. It's good for those around us. It's good for the kingdom of God. It's of profit to all those. Before we're saved, we're utterly, totally, completely useless, good for nothings. It's not until we come to Jesus Christ that we give our hearts and our lives to Him and we come in line with Him that we're of any profit. You see, you can build a kingdom in this earth. You can build houses and barns and own this, that, and the other. Without Jesus, you got nothing. You're unprofitable. But you can be that beggar, Lazarus, that sat outside that gate asking and eating the crumbs that came from the rich man's table and be of great profit to God, spiritually speaking. You see, too much we got our eyes on this world and we disregard eternity. Paul's going to talk about that in a minute. It's eternity that matters, folks. This world, you can get all you can get and can all you can get all you can and can all you get, but it ain't going to be nothing because you're going to be gone. You ain't taking it with you. The only thing you take with you is that faith that you have in Christ and Him crucified and hopefully some of those others that you have been able to minister to and bring them to the knowledge of Christ and Him crucified. Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Paul says Onesimus is of great value. You're worthless before coming to Christ, but you're of great value after coming to Christ. Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is my own, about my own heart is what Paul says. Receive him like you would receive me. That's how we need to be looking at one another. We need to be receiving one another. We need to be our relationship the same one to another. Not more so because that brother got money. What did he talk about? Oh, you, you let them rich folks come in. You say, oh, sit here. But you tell the poor guy, ah, go back there in the back. No respecter of persons. That should be evident in every heart in life that names the name of Christ. But without, verse 13, whom I have retained with me, that in thy steed he might have ministered unto me the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing. Paul is saying, I'm not going to hold him here without first talking with you. 
But without my mind, without thy mind, would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that you should receive him forever. Paul's not talking about Onesimus being the slave of Philemon forever. He's talking about him being his brother. Mm. His brother for eternity. You see, a lot in the church today, we, we've gotten to the point where we don't see one another as brothers and sisters. They're just a somebody. But you see, in Christ, you're my brother, you're my sister. Sometimes brothers and sisters get some headbutting going on. But you know what? We should still be loving one another. We should still be having one another's best interest at heart. Willing even so much as even Christ to give ourselves for the benefit of them. Man, how things would be changed in the church. We wouldn't be fussing over the carpet and the chairs and the paint and the this and the that. Wouldn't be no church splits if that love of Christ was in our hearts as it should be. And it would be if our faith was properly placed. That's what it all comes back to, guys. What's the object of your faith? Who are you trusting in? What are you trusting in? It's going to show in your life. It's going to show by the way you treat your brothers and sisters. It's going to show by the way you live. Are you living a life that says, I'm trusting in Jesus? I don't got to steal. I don't got to commit adultery. I don't have to lie. Mm, because I know my God is in control. And He's going to take care of me. Even if I do stupid. I don't have to lie about doing stupid. I can say, I did it. It was me. Don't have to be the little family circus and have nobody or not me running around there as a little ghost. You seen that little cartoon on there? That, you know, that's going way back to the Sunday paper. But you know, we don't have to, we can own up to it. And see, the Spirit will change us. And what does the Word of God say? Just like here with Onesimus, he says, God will work everything to the good to them that love Him. If you love Him, Jesus said, keep my commandments. Mm. Do we really love Him? Are we living a life that demonstrates that love? See, if I love the Lord, I'm going to love you. Even if you are a stinker. Even if you are a jerk. Let's just put it that way. Even if you've come to me and slapped me upside the head. I'm still going to, I'm going to want to slap you. And watch out I don't get in the flesh. Don't go slapping me thinking I ain't going to get in the flesh because I might. You hear what I'm saying? I'm going to knock you out with five fingers in a love. <laughs> Trust in the Lord. He's your hope. He's your peace. He's your joy. Let the Holy Spirit be doing His work in you. Amen? Amen. We move into Hebrews next week. Get ready. We're going to be there a while. But we're going to learn some stuff. Amen? Amen? Let's stand. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, I'm asking that in every heart and life in this place, Father, and those that are listening, Lord, that you would manifest your love and your mercy and your grace. Father, that we would take this message to heart, Lord, as... We see how Paul dealt with Onesimus, Father, that, Lord, we would deal with one another in love. Lord, glorifying you in every aspect of our heart and our life. Father, as we name the name of Jesus, that, Lord, your spirit would move in us and on us and through us. Father, for your glory and your honor, in Jesus' name. If there's anybody here who needs prayer this morning, if you need prayer and dealing with your brothers and sisters, if you need prayer in just any area, if you just want to spend some time praying, you're welcome to come up to the front here, kneel at these chairs. Ask the Lord, move in me. Lord, make in me 
Give me that heart of flesh rather than that heart of stone. Move in me, Lord, and make me what you want me to be. To spend some time with him. Like I said, we got dinner in the back, so you don't have to worry about that. It's all done and ready to go. But just put your trust in him this morning. Call out to him. He's waiting to hear from you. Make it ever Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. You are the potter. I Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change me, Lord. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Make that your prayer this week. Each day, as you get up in the morning, say, Lord, change my heart. Make me more like you. Mold me and shape me. This is what I pray. Is that what you're praying? Ask Him. He won't turn that prayer down. That prayer won't go unanswered. Yield to Him when He makes those changes. I guarantee you, if you let Him change your heart, you are going to be way better off. And everybody around you is going to be way better off. And it's going to be for the good. It's not going to make you a doormat. And it's not going to make you a pushover. It's going to make you somebody that people look at and say, Man, I want what that guy's got. That's what God originally created you to be. Somebody who's looking to Him and trusting in Him and telling everybody around them by the way they live. Don't You can say it all day with your mouth, but you ain't living it with your heart. You're a hypocrite. Be living it in your life. Amen? Amen.